Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-Centered Leader in Confessional Broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is the mind of Christ. And to do that, we read through the book of Concord, the Lutheran confessions that have faithfully stood the test of time to be a faithful teaching of what Scripture gives to us to believe and that we may confess it also. Uh, and to, to, to work through the book of Concord, we have our cloister of Christ confessing <laughs> Concordians. Nice. Well played. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I didn't give what we're talking about today. I normally do that, but I'm holding it off because our cloister of Christ confessing Concordians includes laymen. Peter Slayton, social media manager of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And we have Pastor Peter Ill, who is the pastor of Trinity in Milstadt, Illinois. And then we have Pastor Timothy Apple, who is the bishop down there in Smithville, Texas. He serves Grace Lutheran Church. And then myself as host, Pastor Sean Smith, and I serve the dual parish of Emmanuel and St. Paul's in Wine Hill, Illinois. And to get back to that issue of what I brought up already, today... We are working through the small called articles. We've been doing this for a few weeks now. Um, got into them maybe about a month or so ago so, or so ago that we, we started the small called articles. And we are now in part two of that, article three, chapters and cloisters. And that's probably not... <laughs> Not language that we're all that familiar with. So maybe even before we I dig into Carcassonne, reading, so I'm very familiar with cloisters. I don't even know what that is. I know it's a great reference that nobody'll get. Yeah, Woo! except unless for they're, nerds, unless they're tabletop gamers. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll just go ahead and then and, and and identify for us what what are we talking about before we even get into reading this and so forth. What are we talking about when we're talking about chapters and cloisters? Why is this in our Lutheran confessions? Why is why is this an issue? All right. Given that my only reference point for this is a game. I'd rather hand this off to one of the other pastors to actually define a cloister. <laughs> when we're talking about chapters and, and cloisters, we're referring to the monastic system um, that, that Luther was a part of uh, for a part of his own life. Um, and, and that was a big part of the, the Roman Catholic Church in Luther's day. Um, this, this system in which uh, a man or a woman would make a vow before God uh, to certain conditions on their life, often involving things like poverty and uh, chastity. Um, they would go and live by themselves in a, a chapter or a cloister in a monastery or um, a nunnery. And and in doing that, uh, the people were Convent, taught, you mean? Sorry. Or convent. <laughs> thank you. Isn't nunnery a word, too? Maybe. It also is. Yeah. It They're is. both valid. Convent is more As more in normal. get the two. Anyway, exactly. go ahead. Yes. So, so the people were taught and they came to believe that in doing so, they were earning a special righteousness before God, uh, something that was uh, more valid, holier um, in God's sight than everyday living, uh, the things that people normally do in terms of being a husband or a wife, uh, mother or father living among society. The idea was that to be in a, a monastery or a convent uh, was a, a holier way of life. So, so then you're identifying that uh, the, these chapters and cloisters are, are really just kind of fancy ways. I mean, it is in, inherent in the, the words themselves. Uh, it's just groupings of people, and specifically these are tied in with the monastic system. Although, I mean, we, we still see this up, you know, like uh, – or see this up. Wow, that is terrible English. We still see this today. I don't do grammar. Yeah, we still see this today, um, you know, in, in – um, uh, well, you know, different different societies and so forth. I, I'm thinking of you know you, you would have like a uh, um, uh, 
the fraternities and sororities and so forth, they would have chapters at different universities. Mm. Um, uh, we can even talk about, you know, our, our uh, LWML, Lutheran Women's Missionary League, or, or I think it's Lutheran Women in Mission is what the name is now. But we used to have, you know, different chapters or societies within that and, and Lutheran Layman Still League do. and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. Although the, they're they're changing all these names on us now, and so it makes it a little difficult to identify <laughs> because that's what our culture does is just change the names of things. But but what we're talking about is groups of people, and specifically here referencing into the monastic orders. And lest we be confused with the way that I started the show, I'm not calling us a monastic order unless I am. I don't know. I don't think you we, are. We can talk about that. <clears throat> we're all married, so that we, would cause a problem right yeah. off the bat. The underlying issue here, and the reason that we care enough to talk about this today, is because this is all about Christian community and Christians coming together. If if you started this show and oh, it's about monks and nuns, I'm not thinking about getting me to a to a nunnery or a convent or a monastery or anything else. Don't go away. Because this is all about Christians living in community, and we will continue to revisit that Christian community issue as we continue through this section of the Smalt Called Articles Part 2, Article 3. I think I got that right, too. Yeah, yeah. And 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 we can reference too that not that long ago we just covered this issue under the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Again, I I think this uh, as we said last week or or was it earlier today? I don't know. It feels like we're we're with you guys all the time here. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we we. Uh, um, we, we reference, you know, how this shows the continuity of our Lutheran confession, that these are the issues, and and whether it's Melanchthon writing in the Augsburg Confession or or the uh, princes in Germany who are presenting that as, yes, we, we agree with this too, and we'll have our heads chopped off, uh, or Luther writing this as his own confession in the Small Called Articles, there's a continuity to our Lutheran confession of that when these are issues, we're going to faithfully confess with Scripture uh, what what is what is right, what is good and what is true and then this is an abuse and we need to talk about the abuses and so forth and so yeah we did just cover this uh, not too long ago in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession however uh, it, this is from Luther's own pen and, and he especially comes from that inside kind of view as a monk himself and so uh, it, we, it bears digging into again I think there's a lot more that we can even cover than we did even when we covered the Apology of the Augsburg Confession so great setup uh, oh okay I was going to just add, add one more more thing in the don't don't leave yet because i think as we look at the subject matter of this article our seminaries would actually come into play in this based on some of the things we're going to talk about so or our concordia university our, system. yeah all all of or that if schools. we're talking about why does this matter today why does this article written 500 years ago matter to me today well it, in a way, it, it'll be talking about our seminaries and our concordias, our parochial schools, like you just said, all of those things. So this is... Even our local church parishes. Yeah. This this yeah. is extremely relevant. Or, and, or any other group that we form, like the Cloister of Christ Confessing Concordians. Maybe. Exactly. <laughs> sure. Hence why I said, maybe I am talking about us. I right? think we need a Facebook group. This sounds official. Ooh, yeah, that would be <laughs> On second group. thought, let's know. Wait. Or maybe our Facebook groups are even an issue here. Ooh. Oh. oh. Oh, that just got thickens. really deep very fast. We, we need sound effects for this show. You know, <laughs> well, we kind of all just provided one at the same time. <laughs> I think we're good. Okay. If if you're still with us through all of that nonsense, uh, let's go ahead and dig into this. And first, I'm going to read. It's, it's a short article, so I'm going to read the whole article. But before I even read the article, I'm going to go ahead and read this editor's note. Is I, I think... Uh, we, we have done a good job setting it up, but I think that this just very succinctly gets us into it as well. So this is uh, part two of the Small Called Articles, Article 3 on Chapters and Cloisters, and this is the editor's note. Reflecting on his own experiences as a monk, Luther rejects the Roman system of monastic life. By making monasticism meritorious for eternal life, Rome contradicted the chief article of the Christian faith. Monasteries were originally founded as institutions of education. Luther advocates returning them to that noble purpose. Otherwise, they should be destroyed. All right, so we're going we're gonna to talk about what all that implies and, and uh, dig into it here. But let's go ahead and get the article itself. Again, a reminder, this is a small called Articles, Part 2, Article 3, Chapters and Cloisters, Paragraph 1. And it's just two paragraphs in this, so I'll go ahead and read it. 
Monastic chapters and cloisters were formerly founded with the good intention of educating learned men and virtuous women. They should be used for that again. They could produce pastors, preachers, and other ministers for the churches. They could also produce essential personnel for the secular government in cities and countries, as well as well-educated young women for mothers, housekeepers, and such. Oh, I'm going to pause it. That could be. That could be. Inter- <laughs> oh, mm, fun times. We'll dig into that. All right. If these institutions will not serve this purpose, it is better to abandon them or tear them down than to have their blasphemous, humanly invented services regarded as something better than the ordinary Christian life and the offices and callings ordained by God. This, too, is contrary to the chief article on the redemption through Jesus Christ. Pausing here, I'm inserting what we've covered earlier as the article on justification. Back to the uh, writing here. Like all other human inventions, these religious institutions have not been commanded. They are needless and useless. They are also occasions for dangerous annoyances and empty works, citing Isaiah 29, 20. What the Hebrew prophets call even, i.e. pain and labor. All right, thus far our article. All right, who wants to, to take us away? I, I feel like I always start with someone who's actually here in the St. Louis area, so I'm going to throw it to Pastor Apple first to start us off here. I think that uh, the way Pastor Ill introduced it earlier about talking about how Christians gather into communities is is a good place for us to think about this article, um, because that that's the way that we can take this and apply it to ourselves today when perhaps we don't too often think about monasteries and, and convents. Um, so, so what happens when Christians gather together? Why do Christians gather together? And, and I, I think one of the primary purposes that God gives in his word for Christians to gather together together is to hear his word, to receive his gifts. And Luther points out that that, that was really the initial point of monasteries and, and convents of these chapters and cloisters was for the intention of educating men and women according to the word of God to produce these learned men and virtuous women, as he said. And, and that would serve a benefit um, to the to the church and also to society as well. Um, and, and so I, I think that that maybe helps us jump in here as to when we gather together as Christians, what are, what are we doing? We're seeking to learn the word of God together and then to put that word of God into practice in our lives. You think about, um, you know, how we pray in the Lord's prayer that God's name would be holy, um, that, that his word would be taught in its truth and purity among us. And then that we'd lead holy lives according to that word. And, and that would be the, the salutary purpose, the good purpose uh, for a, a chapter in Cloister. And maybe that's a good way to get started. Indeed, we talk about this and there is there's a value in Christian community. It, it, like Pastor Smith was mentioning before with our seminaries and with our undergraduate schools that are centered around hearing God's word and learning, not just for the sake of being a a good Christian or even a super Christian, because some of the, some of the folklore and some of the challenge with this, the abuse is that people who gather in Christian community uh, may begin to, by the influence of the sinful flesh, look to themselves to be uh, more holy, more pious, a better Christian than those who are not gathered in that Christian community. There is only uh, one Christ, one mediator, one person who makes us holy, going to a monastery or a convent or a seminary or a parish school doesn't make you any more or less holy. Only Jesus can do that. So I, I have a context question since I like context. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to figure out you know, in all the in all so far in all the other um articles that Luther has said, there's a pretty significant or at least meaningful discourse on here's the abuse going on, here's the wrong thing, here's how it can be used rightly. This one seems very short and I'm actually not seeing the connection with the previous articles necessarily. Why is this here at this point in the small called articles? And it's really, really short and just seems to be like, you know, nice suggestions for how we could use this nice thing with one sentence in the middle of this is the bad way to do it. But it's it's almost like a throwaway article in terms of the the brevity of it and where it's placed within the small called articles. So as I'm trying to wrap my brain around it, 
I, I have no problem with the content, and we're going to talk about that. There's some good stuff in here. I'm just trying to figure out why is he bringing this up, and why is he bringing it up here? In part, he's bringing it up here because it is it it follows along with the various abuses and concerns of the Roman Catholic Church. To remember our greater context of the small cult articles, Luther is writing in preparation for a conference that never happened. And this happens after the Augsburg Confession and the apology of the Augsburg Confession. And Luther has already said a lot of things. Um, and the confessions have already said a lot of things through this time period. Now, Luther says, we're going to start by talking about the, the first and main article, the awe-inspiring glory of God that we see and know in, in the Trinity and especially in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we'll talk a little bit about the abuses. Last week we got to talk about the Mass and the invocation of saints in the Mass and privately. This week we get to talk about chapters and cloisters, monasteries and convents. And these things are being taken advantage of. But I, I wonder if one of the reasons for the brevity is so much of what there is to say has already been said faithfully by Philip Melanchthon in the Augsburg Confession and the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. And by this point, there's there's not a whole lot more of, of you know, pounding the table that's that's really necessary. I think the Lutheran Confessions have been clear on where we stand. There hasn't really been a new development per se. I'm not going to disagree with you at all, um, but I, I'll come at it at another angle here too. Uh, so this is the context of the small called articles. So in this second part here, article one is the chief article, the article upon which the church stands or falls, uh, the article of justification. And so he's he lays that foundation and then he starts addressing all of the issues, the, the abuses in the church that stand against that article of which our, our Christian hope and faith lies in, namely Christ and his all atoning work for our salvation, right? Uh, so that, that's what the church stands or falls on. And so then he lists on that, uh, article two then covers the mass. And in there last week, as, as we reference, uh, we, we covered the invocation of saints that comes at the end of the mass, pastor Shear and pastor Henriksen covered the rest of that article. Um, and, and there's all sorts of abuses that get tied in with the mass and then i think flowing forth from the maths what i see is, is that well who conducts the mass and 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 how do some of these abuses get that get tied in and i think i even referenced uh when we covered the 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 issue of um the mass um in the apology of the augsburg confession um that when i was a pastor in evansville indiana not too far from there is a monastery and a convent and you can actually go and, and still pay to have masses said mm -hmm. all right uh and get indulgences i mean this we're not past this issue and so i mean this 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 issue some of the, a lot of the abuses in terms of the mass also uh come out of the chapters and cloisters the monastic order and and as far as not saying a whole lot about you know i i would just say that the monasticism was so heavily a part of the church in the middle ages that you don't really have to say much to describe it mm -hmm. um just because his immediate context, everybody knows what you're talking about when you're talking about these. And so he doesn't really have to describe them, especially in terms of the abuses um, in, in, in specifics and so forth. But, but he makes this very clear point in here that the main abuse of all of the abuses that can come into it uh, is the issue um, of how it relates to that chief article. And then the next thing that he's going to talk about too, I mean, so he's just hitting bam, 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 all the issues in the Roman Catholic Church, as you rightly said, uh, Pastor Ill. What comes next in Article 4? Well, the papacy, right? Well, who's over the chapters and cloisters? Who's over this whole church that conducts the Mass? And and so I think he's building on points. And, and could you make an argument that he could have structured it in different order? Yeah, I don't know. Um, but this is the order that he went with. And, and, and I think that there is a continuity in that sense uh, giving the context sure but and then i also wanted to jump back before we jump to that context thing pastor ill you brought up um 
uh, that, uh, you know, living in community, in Christian community, it can be really quite a blessing and so forth. But I think that this also speaks to the danger of of the temptation of our sinful flesh that can just so easily, you know, we, we become separatists almost, you know, because because it is such a beautiful, rich thing when brothers dwell together in unity, as Scripture says, right? And and uh, and, and I'm, I was just thinking, as you were mentioning that, you know, the the interesting irony of our, as I've called it here, the, the cloister today and so forth. <laughs> so you, Pastor Apple and myself, all went to seminary together. We were in the same class together. And and, and community. And community. And we lived and worshiped together and so forth. And, and it's just kind of interesting that, I mean, sorry, Layman Slayton, but you're the odd <laughs> guy out here. Um, I didn't get to be a part <laughs> yeah. of that cloister. I mean, so we, we, you know, but uh, we, we do, we, we gravitate towards that. And I, I, I think that that's a very good thing, a very noble thing. I mean, it's, I, I remember the, the great shock. I mean, um, you know, last week, um, both of our seminaries had call day and the placement. I remember the great shock that I had leaving the, the seminary community. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's a wonderful thing where you gather together and you worship together and and, and you you hang around campus and you get to know each other's families and and uh, just talk and study together and, and it's just a beautiful thing and then you get out there in the parish and you kind of feel like you're on your own and it's like whoa where'd all my friends go where where'd my community go and, and it takes so long to develop that and sometimes it never really develops in in our uh, parishes and it really should uh, and we have to be very intentional working that but it, it's yeah it's kind of a shock to the system but at the same time it, it can. Um, and, and I've seen this temptation myself. You want to kind of gravitate back to that special experience in Christian community that you have that you almost idolize it. Uh, you almost turn it into something that uh, becomes very unhealthy. This calls to mind for me that maybe maybe you ask your brothers to be on your radio show with you Indeed. so that you can have that community back again at least once a week and the one yeah. weird outlier yeah and the weird outlier <laughs> you know, we, we needed a layman you filled a quota sorry i oh, love it <laughs> but the, the church doesn't exist in a in a vacuum and christians don't exist in a vacuum or by themselves this calls to mind for me the explanation of the third article of the small catechism. I realize I'm stealing Pastor Apple's thunder, uh, <laughs> but it is the Holy Spirit who calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and puts it together. Jesus and scripture talks about how the church is a temple of living stones, not built with hands, built on the cornerstone of Christ. And so the church gathers in community, not just to be friendly. Indeed, Christians are often very friendly. I know at the church I get to serve, uh, oftentimes I have to interrupt people in their pre-service conversations and invite them to, to go into the sanctuary so that we can hear God's word together. That's not a bad thing. But pastor, donuts. Uh, those are after church. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we, and our, our children make a beeline for the donut table. It's fabulous. Yes. Nonetheless, we do more than simply go to church to be friends or to be nice or to be a social service organization. We go to church to be gathered around the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is preached in his word, as it is read, as it is spoken in the absolution, as it is given in baptism and in the Lord's Supper. And so the church is built upon Christ, and from Christ flows our Christian fellowship and our companionship on the way. And so we go from there as we live as Christians in the community of the church. But as Christians who have sinful flesh, we are quick to find ways to abuse and mislead that process. And we want to make the church about being friendly or doing good things or about this activity or that program or because I'm more active in the church, I'm a better Christian than you are or or any such thing, because we're always trying to find a way to one-up one another, because really, our sinful flesh wants to idolize ourselves. Pastor Apple, we're coming up on a break here, but I want to give you a couple minutes. Uh, anything to add to this discussion before we, we hit that break? That, that same gospel um, by which the Holy Spirit calls us into the church and, and gathers us together as the church also then sends us out as the church. Um, think of how Jesus um, breathed on his apostles after um, that, that first Easter evening and, and sent them just as he had been sent by the Father and then sent them. And, and so 
you know, as, as Pastor L was was speaking, you know, the the church is that wonderful um, fellowship, communion of saints that that Christ has gathered for Himself. But that is not the only realm in which God has has placed us to live, and so to to isolate ourselves um, as the church or to um, only gather together as the church without then going forth and being sent to to live in uh, love toward God and in service toward our neighbor in those those daily lives would would be a misuse of of that which is very easy to fall into because it it does feel um, you know it makes me feel very holy very pious to be within the church and and indeed I, I should know and believe that I am holy in God's sight because of that word that is preached to me in the church um, because of the the sacrament of Christ's body and blood that I received there uh, but but not not in the sense that that I then am, am somehow holier for being in the building or holier for um, for for gathering apart from those other sinners, right? No, no. As one forgiven and redeemed, then um, Christ sends me into those areas of life. He gives me tasks to do that I might serve my neighbor and love, and and that too is a part of of being a Christian. That's very well said. Uh, so much to talk about there, but we got to come up on a break, so we're just going to go ahead and take a hard break, but please come right on back. I'm Pastor Ken Bomberger. Join me weekday mornings at 715 for Orazio, your time of scripture, meditation, and music on KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. For years on Sunday mornings, worldwide KFUO has been broadcasting live worship services for those unable to attend worship or for those who enjoy hearing God's word. This Sunday, our 8.15 a.m. worship comes from Ascension Lutheran Church in St. Louis, Missouri with presiding pastor Reverend Matt Clark. Our 10.45 worship comes from Hope Lutheran Church in St. Anne, Missouri with presiding pastor Reverend Timothy Ostermeyer. Join us on Sunday mornings on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Did you know that your individual retirement account may make the best gift to KFUO? The IRS now allows individuals 70 and a half or older to transfer their required minimum distribution directly to charity and avoid paying the associated income tax. These gifts can provide regular long-term resources to KFUO. If you have questions about making an IRA gift to KFUO, call me, Mary, at 314-996-1518. We'll send a representative out to help answer your questions and help you establish a legacy of giving to your favorite radio station, Worldwide KFUO. Did you know that it was the state of Massachusetts in 1852 that inaugurated the first statewide compulsory school system? By 1918, every state had compulsory attendance laws with the idea that public schools provide a religiously neutral education for students. Horace Mann advocated for compulsory education as the first secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education and is considered the father of American public education. His curriculum featured the Bible as a tool to teach moral character, Judeo-Christian values, and responsible, virtuous citizenship. Mann also believed that the Bible should be taught without doctrine or theology. He said, our system allows it to do what it is allowed to do in no other system, to speak for itself. But here it stops. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. to Concord Matters with our cloister chapter of Christ Confessing Concordians, layman Peter Slayton, Pastor Peter Ill, Pastor Timothy Apple, and myself, Pastor Sean Smith. And we continue to discuss this uh, Article 3 from Part 2 of the Small Call of 
small cult articles uh, on chapters and cloisters, and uh, that that's related to monasticism in the Middle East medieval church and well still today it's still around with us and uh we we were talking about how we we can have this tendency in in a very good and godly way to be drawn into this i, I one of the things that uh i i was thinking of as we were talking in the first half of the show about kind of our tendency to be drawn into these uh groups and pastor apple right before the break uh, rightly framed for us you know how how we are to be sent out you know in in love towards god and service towards our neighbor uh from these groups where we gather together to hear uh, God's word and to gather around his sacrament and so forth. Um, But, you know, in just discussing, you know, how we gather together as a group, I I know you you talked about Pastor Ill in the first half there, how you were going to steal Pastor Apple's thunder because you quoted the catechism, which is something that he does. Right? And he does it better than I do, for the well, record. But, but we, we all do, and we all should, right? Indeed. Uh, even, even Layman Slayton, right? Because, you know, yes. what was the catechism, what does it say right at the beginning, as the head of the household should yes. teach? Yes. To his family, to teach his family, right? yeah, and 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 so you certainly do that. I know your mm-hmm. children are, are very well catechized, as as all laymen. And, I hope so, <laughs> and, and pastors should, right? Uh, and, and your wife certainly contributes to that effort yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. in support of that role as well. And, and, and it's just a, a beautiful thing. And so, what it really boils down to me for is when we talk about chapters and cloisters or gathering Christian community, isn't the basis of this family? I mean, it, it makes me think. You know, I, I know. Um, when we covered this issue under the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, uh, we, we referenced a book that's kind of popular, or maybe it's fading out of popularity a little bit, but a couple of years ago uh, by Rob Dreher, The Benedict Option, which hmm. kind of encourages to, to go back to that Benedictine order for a monastery of the monks and so forth. And he doesn't quite take it all the way that, yeah, we need to establish these monasteries again. Um, but uh, I, I, rem- I, I think, was it Cheryl Magnus, who actually works here in the IC, uh, wrote a blog post kind of uh, uh, responding to her thoughts on reading that book. And she said, you know, I, I realized at the end of this, well, I already do that. It's called the family, right? <laughs> and, and so that, that is the place where it begins for us, especially according to scripture, right? That's the, that's the primary chapter cloister group that we're gathered together in by God himself. And it provides for us the most holy orders of life, which is a point that Luther's making here. And, and, and I want us to get to this in the second uh, show. So, sorry, I'm taking a long time to set this up, but but that that's the holy orders of life. And, and it begins there. And we, we can have our our seminary, as we referenced in the first half of the show, we can have our Concordias, we can have our, our parish schools, uh, we can have our parishes, we can have any sort of group that gathers around this. And when we fall into that temptation of of just staying there and not and not living in, in love and service to our neighbors out in the world and so forth, um, that, then it becomes a corruption of what that group is formed for and, and, and to strengthen us in. Christian community happens in uh, sometimes in permanent orders or in permanent uh, places such as the family or the Christian congregation. And other times, Christian community happens for a time. Uh, Thinking about, for example, seminary or school or some of the more more infrequent gatherings that happen that are really time limited for the gathering of Christian community. What the small call articles are are objecting to is the idea that you would give your life to God permanently, remove yourself from the God-given places where you have been called to hear God's word and to teach God's word, and that you would remove yourself from the world in order to be separated. Uh, And so there isn't a division from the world that we make as Christians. Instead, we say, oh, I have been called in loving service to God and to my neighbor, and that happens in my family. That happens uh, if, I'm, if I'm blessed to be a, be a student or a seminarian or, or in some form of Christian community. That's excellent. And sometimes those come to an end for the glory of God as we teach his word and continue to grow in Christian community always. And sometimes, especially this article hits it pretty hard, sometimes they need to come to an end. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's because they've strayed from their intention. And and here, even building again upon why does God place us into family, especially when we understand the fourth commandment and what uh, charge God gives to fathers 
head as heads of the household and so forth. It's it's for the instruction of children, for the education of children. And they make that point here in the article that this was the good intention of even these chapters and cloisters and, and monasticism in general. That was the intention. Uh, but then he gives us an, an evaluation tool of uh, when when do these chapters and cloisters need to be disbanded or torn down and, and done away with? Pastor Apple, I'm going to let you go ahead and comment on this. What do you think here about uh, what Luther says about it began with good intentions, um, but uh, we've maybe strayed from that a little bit. One of the things that, that Lutherans sometimes talk about, and you hear Luther talk this way, is that the, the Christian lives in three estates. I think I used the word realm earlier, but the way Luther of, often talks is that the Christian lives in three estates, and those three estates are the family, the church, and then the state, right? Society or, or the government. And and each of those estates in which God has placed the Christian is a holy order, a, a place that God has given for service. You know, at, we serve each other in the family as husbands and wives and mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and, and brothers and sisters and, and so forth. Uh, within the church, we, we serve each other as as pastors and, and lay people, um, and, and, and that's a good service. And and then within the, the realm or the estate of the of the state, you know, we serve each other as fellow citizens in the way that we interact and, and work together within that community in which we live. And and monast or the chapters and cloisters as they were originally set up supported those three three estates it it produced uh, faithful fathers and mothers it, it they produced uh, faithful pastors and faithful lay people and they produced um, helpful citizens and and those who would uphold peace and justice but when they stopped doing that then they became something that that was completely unhelpful and they ended up withdrawing people from all three of those estates um, rather than encouraging the family life uh, monasticism began to teach that withdrawing from it was actually holier before God. And, and rather than, you know, encouraging pastors and lay people to work together within the church, it, it ended up dividing the church as if monks and, and nuns were holier than others. And rather than pushing people with, into their communities to work within that estate, the, the state, the, it, it pulled people out of that as if somehow it was less than holy to, to work in the civil realm. Um, and, and so monasticism, by withdrawing people from those three estates in which God has given us good works to do, ended up being contrary to the purposes, uh, that, that, that the good purposes that was intended. And so Luther says, look, if it's not going to do good things and according to what God has said, then might as well not do it at all. Tear it down. That connects in with right at the end of paragraph one, and and I paused in reading this and said, "Whoa, this could be dangerous conversation," you know, especially in our day and age that just doesn't like to hear these words. But I think it ties in with the point you're making quite well. Uh, right at the end of paragraph one, it says they could also produce essential personnel for the secular government in cities and countries, as well as well-educated young women for mothers, housekeepers, and such. And and we we just you know our you know, uh, trigger warnings go off or whatever in our modern age when we hear these things. Oh, what are you saying? Well, what, what he's saying is that, you know, very clearly in Scripture, we cannot deny this as Christians. Very clearly in Scripture, this is a holy order given to especially women to be mothers, right, to, to care for the household. Um, you know, I, I think maybe we just imagine, you know, someone who just hangs around the house dusting all day or whatever, you know, and it's kind of a, a heavy-handed thing and so forth. But it, it's the care of the household in, in, in general terms way beyond dusting and doing laundry or anything else it's just you know a, a good and necessary work that we need um for the for the good maintenance of the house and so forth but it all flows forth from that idea of being mothers and so forth and and why would he even make this point well because what had monasticism developed in well we have no mothers we have no family being built on <laughs> because you, you take a vow of celibacy and, and they weren't even all that good and faithful with that, which was one of the abuses that was heavily mm -hmm. covered in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Melanchthon had heavy words for um, those sorts of abuses that, you know, you take these vows of celibacy and then you're not even living that way. You're not living chaste lives. Um, but that was the apology. And here Luther just says, look, like you're, you're subverting these holy orders that God created for us to live in, both in the secular and, and primarily in the household and, and they're just not in, in existence if we think that that's a mo more holy order and so it's it's withdrawing them from those those godly vocations that are given to us in scripture or saying that they're less than service 
in the church in that sense. And I think we can make a lot of contemporary applications here too, but, but maybe uh, we'll get into that here in a second. Well, I, I think the, the, the phrase that I actually focused on in that last sentence is the well-educated young women. That Luther's assumption here is that whatever the young women are doing, especially in this holy calling of of motherhood and housekeeping and such. I mean, he he's listing this in a whole bunch of other things. He actually has the expectation that it is a good and worthy thing for young women to be well educated, which is I don't know how countercultural that was back then, but I know we have a stereotype today that says that's very countercultural for women to be well educated and here's luther saying it doesn't matter your station in life your vocation wherever it is you are serving if you are a young woman these places can serve to well educate you and this is a good thing and these places should be doing that and that education focuses on the word of god yeah for your service to the world around you your education comes first and foremost from Holy Scripture, from receiving the gift, from the fellowship and the relationship of, of Christian community to uh, to be gathered together and to serve God. And as you do that, it's all about your place as a Christian. Your place as a Christian informs your place as a mother, your place as a housekeeper, your place as a husband or a father, as a pastor or a garbage collector or a banker or anything else that you do uh, is informed by who you are in Christ. And so Christ is the cornerstone of Christian community for all people, uh, not just in a monastery or a convent, but for each and every person listening to this program, Christ is the cornerstone of how you interact and relate in the world. And, and I think that gives us the evaluation tool. And, and here I am not talking in a derogatory nature at all about our parish schools or our Concordias or anything like that. So, so please don't hear anything into this. But I, but I think that we do well to constantly, all the time, uh, be evaluating what, what is going on in our schools, what, what's going on in our family, what's going on in our society, and evaluating, are, are we being faithful to this charge that we're given in, in being centered on the Word of God? Because, and, and, and this is the point that we made last week in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the invocation of saints and so forth, and, and again, is the con broader context and connection into this, anything that stands against that chief article, anything that I start, because I'm a part of this group, I'm okay and I'm good, uh, you know, I'm saved and, and, and I'm living a holy life, well, that, that leads us away from Christ, that leads us away from how we are uh, have assurance of our salvation it becomes very, very dangerous. And, and so it's somewhat assumed in here because it doesn't necessarily hit that nail on the head, but you, you brought it in quite well. And, and Luther would certainly get, if he were Baptist and amen to it or something, you know, but, uh, uh, he, you know, Lutherans can do that too. We're just scared right. to. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, I mean, th this is the point. It, it all flows forth from being grounded there in the word. And, and so, yeah, whatever, order you are called to in life, you know, St. Paul would even say as a single person, what, what's your sole focus service mm -hmm. to Christ and, and, and his word to his glory. Right. Um, because that, that's the order that is given to you be faithful in it. And, and when we understand that we don't, we don't have to have our trigger warnings going off. We don't have to get all upset about, you know, Oh, well, you know, we're, we're just saying women that their place is at home again. I mean, you, you made the point. I mean, to be a well-educated woman, yeah, I have no problem saying my wife, who's a stay-at-home mom, right, uh, caring for our son, she is much more intelligent than I am. I mean, she, <laughs> she knows Latin and uh, was a classical educator. And so, I mean, she's very intelligent. Uh, and, and we need that gift. I mean, someone has to care for our son. Right now, we can we can in good order and good conscience and Christian freedom entrust that to someone else. Uh, we have chosen to order our family where she is given that natural ability to nurture our child, and so we're just going to provide for her to have that opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you know she she doesn't need to be you know uneducated or you know unable to fend for herself or anything anything <laughs> of that nature. I mean, is quite the contrary, and it only strengthens our family and and as a service to our son and educating him and raising him and 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 a benefit to me as a as a husband and pastor uh in my vocations as well uh that that you know 
that this is well ordered, but what's again the foundation? It's it's Christ and His gospel, His word, mm-hmm. forming and informing our life to His glory. Um, and, and and you work out how you order that, but but you never think that well because we do it this way, because my wife is a stay at home mom and and I'm a pastor of a church. Well, that's that's the right way. No, we're not legalistic <laughs> about this, right? I'm not going to tell anyone else that well you're doing family wrong, right? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, we we've worked that out for ourselves and our family. Um, and, and I hope I'm not going off on a side tangent about my family or anything. I'm just using it as an example as one that I can use. Um, but, uh, what, what is, what is grounded here is what's the intention? What, what is it that we want to do here? Well, we want to raise up people in the faith to, to, to live in the glory that Christ has saved them, uh, and, and to serve their neighbor in love. And, and that's, we, we've covered this general idea several times in in the Augsburg Confession as we're going through that and in the Apology as well on monastic vows, particularly focused on the monks and and those who have taken those particular vows. And the very idea, we talked about this, where the monks were told, if you take this vow, you receive special powers to, to be celibate and that temptation goes away entirely. You are receiving an extra merit before God, all that kind of stuff. And as a, especially as they highlight meritorious to eternal life. Yes, for <laughs> eternal life, all all of that stuff. And so, as as I've been processing this article as we're going through it, I think what Luther has done here is he's expanded that. So we've we've covered the very specific in in other episodes, and now Luther is expanding it to the the institutions themselves. And so, if we're going to say, all right, we've talked about it in the context of the family, um, I think we can all we we mentioned that this applies to our Concordias and our Lutheran schools. And I can very easily, because I've heard this, <laughs> I've heard this done. I myself have been tempted and many times in various ways to do this. But for, for example, I homeschool. So my kids are homeschooled. And in that sense, it's a, it's You're Lutheran. clearly better than everyone. Well, yeah, it's Lutheran better. homeschooling. I can give them the most faithful Lutheran education because, well, we're all Lutherans and that's all they're going to get in my, my homeschool. Therefore, we are better Christians. We are better Lutherans than anybody who, I'll use the typical foil, might send their kids to public school. That entire scenario is utterly and totally false. Because I've set it up as us doing this thing is better and puts us in a better standing with God as better Christians than you who has made a different choice and does a different thing. Because I've placed the focus on what I'm doing as that which improves my standing before God. Replace homeschooling with your Lutheran parochial school, with your classical education Lutheran school with your classical education model with your public school with anything else whenever you are placing that as the thing that improves your standing before God you're you're creating you're falling into the error that Luther is trying to point out here and so this this does still occur today for all of us it's a, once again it's another temptation we all face just like invocation of the saints and abuse of prayer I still want to look at how I've ordered my life and say that because I've ordered my life in this way, I'm a better Christian than that person over there who's ordered their life differently. Absolutely. And and, and I, I want to belabor this point a little bit <laughs> for, for a while <laughs> because I think it's so vitally important. And, and I certainly went on for uh, a while on it, too. But I mean, that's the key is that in, in evaluation for your family. For, for what is best for your family, mm-hmm. you, you spend some time thinking about it and you've and you've chosen to order your your family in this way that's a good thing and i don't want to talk bad about that mm-hmm. all right and, and i don't think you are either um, now the temptation that we have you've rightly pointed to is that because I have chose to do it this way right well, that's the way that it has to be or or you're not you don't really care about your kids or you know anything you're like that you're not really a Christian like I am and we would never say that. Um, but there is that temptation, and yeah. some do say that, right? Um, or we say things that sound like we're saying that. Right. Because we're, we're not careful. And, 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 and maybe <laughs> and we are a little proud and arrogant. And, yeah, and <laughs> absolutely. I mean, sometimes it, it, maybe maybe I don't come out and say it, but I'll I'll... I'll be I'll confess my own struggle mm. right here on Worldwide KFU Radio of you know maybe just because I don't say it maybe though subtly deep down I I do actually I think that yeah. right um 
but uh, I should repent of that. Yeah, but but a- but again, I want to come back to this this point here that I do think that we we do want to talk about how we intentionally order our lives mm-hmm. to the glory of Christ. Right? Do do I think that we should have very intentional conversations? in our families, in our Christian communities and so forth, about what is the best way to educate our children in the faith, especially, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Is it dangerous things that are taught in the public schools? I went through public schools for part of my education growing up. I can tell you firsthand, there are dangerous, faith-destroying lies out there. Now, am I saying that because my parents sent me to a public school that they didn't care about me as a Christian child of theirs? No, right? Uh, they, they, they worked out the situation, and I can spend time in conversation and evaluation with them and, and, and implications for my own family. I'm not saying that people don't care about their children because they send them to public school. But I do want to encourage at the same time, this, the, the Christian life is one held in tension. We need to be intentional and we need to spend some time in thinking and consideration and so forth uh, about, you know, best ways. But we can't we can't fall off to the other side of the horse uh, or mule or whatever else word we might insert there and, and say, well, because you do this, that you're somehow less than and so forth. Because then again, we do fall into this same trap here uh, that we're, we're discussing in monasticism. Mm. Um, but I think evaluation is the key. And especially I'm going to throw it back to Pastor Apple here because uh, I'm sure he has lots to chime in with here. <laughs> um, but uh, again, I, I think an evaluation of our institutions. And it's not talking bad about our institutions or our parishes or anything of that nature. But we need to evaluate and have intentional conversations and think about what is it our institutions are doing and are they flowing forth from that primary primary work of the church and and, and educating and so forth. Pastor Apple. We really need to to keep the focus on on what God has said. Um, The chapters and cloisters here in this article, the monastic system, had taken its focus off of what God had said. And and when we think, you know, as Lutherans often talk about the law and the gospel, the two ways that God speaks to us, different ways, both good ways. Um, And and monasticism takes its focus off of both. In, In terms of the law, monasticism replaces what God has said is a good thing to do with humanly invented works. And in terms of the gospel, then, it it follows immediately from that, that monasticism then places its trust in those humanly invented works rather than in Christ. And and as, as, you know, as we're talking about these various ways, then, that this applies to us today, we need to keep our focus in that same place on what God has said in his word. So when it comes to the ways that we're going to educate our children, for example. What has God given us to do in his word? He's given us to raise our children in the faith, to to make sure that they hear the word of God regularly, that they might place their trust in Christ and then be of service to their neighbor. He's not commanded us specific ways to do that. He's not said it must be a home school or it must be a Lutheran parochial school or it must be a public school or or classical school or, or whatever the solution is. We have freedom within within that command that he's given to raise our children to be Christians. We have freedom as to how we accomplish that. And the temptation that Luther's talking about here can express itself as as we've been saying, to think that because I've chosen to fulfill this command of God in this way that I'm better than you. And and in doing that, I've just broken both the law and the gospel because suddenly I've, I'm placing my trust not in Christ alone, but in my own works. And and that's where it's it's so dangerous. And and then, you know, maybe to, to, to take it into another realm um, for, for some of our listeners who maybe aren't raising children right now, you know, think about your, your work within the church. Are you holier because you serve as an usher in your church? Are you holier because you do something in the church building because you, you cook for the, for the school or, or because you teach Sunday school? Those are certainly good things to do, but they don't make us holy in God's sight. What makes us holy in God's sight is Christ alone. And so we, we absolutely must keep our focus on what, what he has said. And when we start there, we're in a much better place to avoid this temptation that Luther's talking about here. I, I think you're on a great point there, and I know Layman Slayton wants to join in, but w- one thought that I had thought, 
of tier two was that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we have this temptation that because we go do a short term mission work, right? Or we serve. Oh, as a that's a popular one. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, clearly. I'm going to put oh, in my time serving God for one week. Yeah. I've done it. Woo. Yeah. And just, I, I mean, it's rife with temptations. And, and I think you hit on a gold mine here. I mean, it's like listening to CFW Walther again, that great uh, uh, theologian for our church body. A little long gospel, right? <laughs> I mean, just what does Jesus deal with in terms of the Pharisees and their Pharisaical, uh, you know, temptation? So we're, we're no different, right? He, he, he condemns the Pharisees for supporting themselves on the law invented by men, right? Uh, they've taken what God has said and encouraged us to do and to live in full trust and belief in and and we make it in human invented work. That's our sinful flesh. Just we don't get past it. We don't get, um, yeah, we, we keep making the same sinful mistakes over and over again. But uh, we could go on and on about this, but, but let it suffice for this, that it, it is good to educate children. It is good to educate ourselves. It is good to serve to the glory of God in the church. You don't have to, to, to leave your daily vocations, and you certainly are not more holy because you do. God has made you holy. He has done it through his son, Christ Jesus. That's the article of justification, the whole article in which the church stands and falls on, and that's what we confess here today. So thanks for stopping by, and until next time, keep confessing that truth, church.